that movie beat down as we continue with Seagal Month. This week, it's Mercenary for Justice. Mercenary for Justice is another one of Seagal's director video efforts, this time from 2005. This one is notable as being one of the films that Seagal made for Millennium Films. You see, Seagal and the producers had a falling out with each other. The producers claimed that Seagal was unprofessional, showed up late on set, and rewrote the script, which, given the quality of the movie, doesn't really surprise me. IMDb credits four uncredited writers, in fact. As a result, Seagal countersued and claimed he would never work with that production company again. This is the reason why Seagal did not appear in the Expendables, nor would he appear in its sequel, because those films were also made by Millennium Films. This is going to be an interesting review for me, because I have seen Moo before, but I didn't really understand it. That's right, folks, I've been beaten by a Seagal movie, so bear in mind when you're watching the review, I'm trying to make as much sense of it as you are. So the movie starts at CIA headquarters. Well, this is a very sensitive operation. That island is considered a CIA asset. I want those independent contractors believing they're liberating those people. Really? Another film using title cards to hastily introduce characters? I mean, is there really an official CIA dirty deeds man position? Sounds a bit informal. Did you think that I was going to tell them that they're risking their lives so that we can get rich off of diamonds and oil? Oh, even better, it's a misspelled title card, because apparently the word ops is very easy to misspell. It's three letters for crying out loud. So yes, these two are obviously our film's bad guys, because one's Luke Goss and the other is a foreigner with a British accent, which makes him doubly evil. By the way, guys, I know I abuse fades in my videos, but for goodness sake, lay off the fate of blacks. It feels like I'm drifting in and out of consciousness. Or falling asleep, which given the triteness of this setup wouldn't surprise me. So they go through the team of mercenaries who they will be hiring for the job, but it's not like you're going to remember who any of these people are, and this is about as much personality as we're going to get for them. Let's face it, the only one we're interested in hearing about is Seagal to see how much ego stroking there is. John Seagal, the most decorated soldier in the first Gulf War best at doing what he does. Yep, yeah, expected nothing better from Seagal. He's the best there is. Just make sure you keep it under control, Chapel. We don't need a war. Peace. That's the closest we'll get to wit in this movie. I'm surprised he didn't make the peace sign while he was at it. So we move to Africa, where war has broken out between French forces and, I don't know, Seagal's team of mercenaries? Kruger and de Kirk, rogue members of Seagal's team, are there, but Seagal himself is noticeably missing. Kruger leads an attack on the French ambassador's home, where a female soldier, through some badly choreographed action, takes out four guards by herself. <laughs> This is plainly a girl they picked because she was hot, rather than the fact that she could take you in a fight. Oh, and the French ambassador's home shows wealth and a complete blissful ignorance of the warfare outside, including classical music playing in the background. Could this be... political satire? Careful, Seagal movie, you'll give yourself an injury! Bonjour. What are you doing here? You know what the fuck I'm doing here. No! Actually, we don't! We're ten minutes into this movie and already I'm confused. The reason that we're given is that they're taking him as a bargaining chip to get out of the country. Then there's loads of carnage and warfare and I have no idea who the good guys are and who are the bad guys. I don't even think it matters, it's just random fighting that doesn't have anything to do with the plot. <laughs> I think he was dead after you cut his throat. You didn't need to chuck him out of the building. Unless that was the other guy. I'm so confused! Finally, over ten minutes into the film, Seagal actually bothers to show up in his own movie. It doesn't surprise me that Seagal is late on set because he's late for his own bloody movie. Get head office on the secure line! And apparently he was late for the day he was recording voiceover narration for this movie too. Maxine, what are you doing here? You're supposed to stay out of the danger zone, gather and tell only. Well, how's this for intel? The friendship landed. Somebody fucked us! Seagal begins to realize that maybe, just maybe, the people that employed him might have screwed him over. Those mercs, they figured out who they're working for. And what difference does that make? We're still working the plan, Sigma. Didn't you say there would be no counter support? Is Seagal on the same line as those two? Is it a three-way phone call? And if it is, shouldn't he be able to hear them be evil and plotting? You really want them back, Chapel? No help at all. 
Chapel, you and Gresham fuck us on this, I'm gonna stick my 45 up your ass and break every bone in your body. And if he's not supposed to know who he's working for, why does he know their names? Especially Dresham's! Chapel, this is getting out of control. The next time that you and the agency want to plan a little business trip, dial someone else. Fucking yank. Oh, I'm totally overacting every line for maximum poshness. With no reinforcements coming for their extraction, Jones, Seagal's friend, calls in for a helicopter. Wait, hold on. He's Seagal's best friend, he's black, and he's in a war. Oh, he is so dead! I should have dragged you into this, John! They used me to get a hold of you, man! His life expectancy was in negative numbers! You hang on, son. Take care of Eddie. Hang on, Jones, you hear me? Chandra. Hang on, man. Yeah, this cliche war movie scene doesn't really work when one of the characters keeps switching voices. Back with Kruger and the French ambassador, he orders the French forces to stand down or he will kill the ambassador. What just made the building explode? Can you see why I'm so confused? The French forces continue to fire for reasons never really explained, despite the colonel telling them to stand down, so Kruger kills the ambassador. Why? You just killed your bargaining ship! Now the French want to kill you even more! So Seagal does his extremely low-budget rendition of Black Hawk Down, carrying Jones' body because that makes him more heroic. Seagal gets to the chopper, with Kruger and Dekirk joining them as they make their escape. Moving from that incomprehensibility to Florida, where Seagal goes to visit Jones's family, where we learn the stunning range of Seagal's acting abilities. Casualties of war. Even with the death of his friend, Seagal's expression is unflappable except in extreme close-ups. Truly breathtaking. Also breathtaking is the way that every shot with Seagal is lit so that his face is in the shadows to try and hide his greasy skin and double chin. To say this didn't work is the understatement of the year, especially with scenes like this. Yep, Seagal is too fat to climb over walls now, and his stunt double couldn't be any more obvious. Seagal sneaks up on a van outside Jones's house, sent by Dresham, whose men he just casually kills right in front of his friend's house. You think he tried to be a bit more stealthy in the middle of suburbia? Seagal takes the van, but gets caught up by Kruger. It turns out Seagal and his mercenaries are being hired by Chapel. Chapel has been hired by a Greek arms dealer, the father of the South African dictator that was deposed in South Africa to free his son from prison. Chapel wants Seagal to do the job, but he doesn't want to do it at first. Please, John, don't let them hurt my baby. We need your help. They say they're going to take us to Africa. John, I am going to need your help. Well, it wouldn't be a Seagal movie if someone close to Seagal wasn't being kidnapped. Dresham lands in Miami where he encounters Maxine, another one of Seagal's regular team of mercs, now under Chapel's employee outside the airport. Dresham makes her work for him, and I don't even have a clue why she was even there and why she isn't flying with Seagal. And frankly, I need a school card to work out who is with who. Chapel has plenty of muscle and money. Where he chooses to flex them is none of my business. But she and Seagal one last time was, right? Does he have something on you? So John does have a weakness. Meaning what? Meaning he'll come for you. Did that conversation make sense to anyone? How did he figure out that Seagal was still in love with her based on what she just said? Face it, you're just as baffled as I am! So Chapel flies Seagal and his mercenaries to Africa, where Seagal and his men plan to break into the prison when the guards make their shift change. Fuck yeah, but why don't we use nerve gas on these pussies? Well, with nerve gas, we're quite afraid that we may kill everybody similar to the girls that you are used to killing. Get up! I think it's much better. We act like professional soldiers. Whose bright idea was it to bring this trigger-happy idiot along? All he seems to want to do is to kill people, and that's not exactly brilliant for a search and rescue mission. Drasham follows them there on the next flight using Maxine as a spy. She lies to Drasham and tells him that there is going to be an attempt on a bank. Of course, this bank is supposedly impossible to break into, so they're taken on a tour where, unbeknownst to Drasham, Maxine takes photographs. Drasham must be a very gullible idiot to believe her and take her everywhere, especially 
Ridley because she's a very obvious femme fatale. However, Segal and Chapel are onto Maxine's game. I understand that you want to use Maxine as a distraction, but we do need to do something about her. I'll do it. Well done. Wait, I thought she was playing both sides, so why is he asking for her to be killed? I swear, Mission Impossible was easier to follow than this. Segal obviously isn't going to kill her and instead takes her to a fancy restaurant. <laughs> Lobster's good here, I'm gonna order you some. Segal calls up Chapel to make demands. How do you know when you're a cliche villain? When you start playing the piano to relax between dastardly deeds. Chapel here. We played your game long enough. And what makes you think that you have any leverage, old chum? One call and there's a bullet in the boy's brain. A terrible thing to waste. I'm talking about the bullet. I swear I want to strangle this guy! And I know that's good for a villain, but he's a horrible actor! He just keeps speaking the lines slowly, with enunciation, and keeping his mouth open. Segal demands proof of life of Jones's family. He gets it, but he needs to go to the toilet. And that's when Dresham's men tries to attack him. Yeah, I think that's Segal's double on the toilet seat there, since Segal's fat ass would probably break the damn thing. You looking for me? Yeah, that's it for you, poop hole. Poop hole? Really? Are you twelve? So a fight scene ensues. The good thing I can say about it is that Segal is doing his own fighting, it seems. The bad news is that it's a terribly edited one-sided curb stomp battle. The typical Steven Segal fight scene, then. Oh, come on! He clearly didn't hit him, but you played the sound effect anyway! When he blows his cues that badly, no wonder he's doubled. They also reuse bits of the fight to make it longer, which is rather sad, before Segal eventually snaps the guy's neck. I find myself pining for the toilet fight in True Lies. Those urinals weren't even attached to anything! And speaking of bits that remind me of True Lies, Segal and Maxine start dancing. The following day, Drusham thinks Segal is going to hit the bank today and orders every unit of police to protect the bank. Well, well, well. You've made it abundantly apparent that I don't work for you anymore. How exactly do you miss Steven Segal being in the back seat of your car? He's a blob for crying out loud. He can't exactly hide. As Segal holds Dresham at gunpoint, he gives Kruger the go-ahead for his team to go inside the prison and extract the dictator. Yep, Segal is not even where the main action is occurring. I'm sure that doesn't say anything. As you've probably figured out, this was a setup by Segal, or something, because the dictator is not in his cell. Kruger and his men get caught in the execution room, where Kruger's men are picked off by the guards. And no, you're not the only one who is reminded of the shower scene shootout in The Rock. It's sad when the best thing I can say about an action movie is how much it reminds me of scenes from other better action movies. Kruger and de Kirk make it out alive and hijack a big orange tank. We are home and dry, my brother! That was just plain tempting fate. So after a solid ten minutes where the action has been centred entirely away from him, we return to Segal. You got any last words? Oh, lucky here. Popo just came up in here. What are you waiting for? Back door! Man's a fucking ghost. Really? We're not gonna buy that this guy is lightning fast when he's twice the guy he used to be. He looks two steps away from a heart attack. It's like he just disappeared into fat air. <laughs> Maxine tells Dresham that the bank job was a diversion and Dresham relocates the police to the prison. This allows them to do the bank job, which they execute by posing as cops investigating a bomb scare. The heist isn't even that thrilling to watch since it's all electronic with intense close-ups of USB drives and laptops, which is hardly exciting to watch. Ugh, how am I going to write about this? See? People writing at computers is boring! The arms dealer is wondering where the hell his son is. Wait, hold up. Wow, that arms dealer has a surprisingly prolific DVD collection. I certainly didn't figure him being a fan of both Star Wars and Audrey Hepburn. This is obviously the producer's house. God, I'm such a nerd. 
Chapel, angered that Segal has screwed him over, gives him an ultimatum. Wire him some of the money from the bank, or he will kill Jones's family. Segal blackmails the Greek army chief of staff to arrest the arms dealer, but not before he has put a bounty on Chapel's head. Can you see how things have become very convoluted now? And don't worry, folks, because that bounty never amounts to anything. But Segal is rumbled as the police arrive at the bank due to a compromised access code. Asshole alert. Come with me, sir. Yeah. So Segal takes care of the cops and the guards trying to arrest him, and he and Maxine even kill several in cold blood. Mercenary for justice? Hardly. Now there's nothing that separates him from Kruger, who was meant to be a bad guy. You know, I kind of gave the whole bank heist thing a pass because it's plays a Robin Hood style scenario, but when your supposed hero is shooting down innocent cops who are only doing their jobs, you've crossed the line. The sheer hypocrisy of the characterization is astonishing. Segal incapacitates Dresham before Pitbull, posing as police, helps them stage their escape. Segal puts some of the money in Dresham's account, framing him for the robbery. Oh, that Segal, he brought him to justice. Maybe he could turn himself in next. The next thing Segal needs to do is rescue Jones' family, and yep, it's finally appeared Segal's long trademark leather trench coat. The family isn't there, but a shootout does occur because this action flick needs more spice. Gun! Dang, bad parking. Bad one-liner. They go to the safe house where Segal's body double takes out the bad guys. Actually, Segal and his double might actually be two different people, since Segal seems to be attacking from the front, whereas his double tried going for the rear. Segal and his double morph back into one person eventually, where he manages to kill some more bad guys. It's okay. I'm sure the kid's gonna be fine after he just saw you slash a guy's throat before his eyes. Chapel tries to escape, but Segal is in his way. Now, Chapel has a very interesting character trait I haven't mentioned yet. I never touch a gun. Sorry. That's your job. So what do you think he'll do, viewers? Will he A, talk down Segal in a civilized debate, or B, pull out a gun uncharacteristically? You have a gun. If you answer B, congratulations, because you can write a shitty Segal movie. Come on, shoot me down. I didn't think so. You know why? Because I'm the only son of a bitch who could do the things that you always want getting done. What the hell kind of reason is that? He's hardly going to hire you for the next job since you pretty much betrayed him. And he could just shoot you, and the movie's over. And quite right you are, sir. I'll see you on the next gig. Luckily, the movie's actual finish isn't that far away. Chapel gets into a car and drives away. I bet you can't see where this is heading. You mean to tell me you let that milk toast pussy get away? Man, I always thought he had an explosive personality. Oh! He knows that it had explosive personality. Thanks for explaining the joke, Stephen. It's hardly like you're a master of wit. So the day is saved and Jones gets his honorary funeral. I promised I would bring him back. Yes, this is a very moving tribute to a character we hardly knew. Credits, please! Mercenary for Justice is a typical example of a director video Segal movie. I've probably made this movie seem comprehensible, but believe me, this movie is so haphazard, I was having a hard time working out what was going on, especially in the first war-torn 20 minutes. The movie is very predictable and full of lazy double crosses and bad plotting, and its direction and editing is generally poor. If there is one thing that makes this movie above average for Segal's recent body of work, is that he actually appears in it more than usual, doing his own fights and being double less, both in audio and visual terms. Yes, the standard of a Seagal movie is not based on the script, but more how much the star actually bothers to appear in it. I am Benzai, and this movie is bullshit. 